your head anybody you've been slimed look at that we have something in common yes i actually have had all those things happen to me i am a former nickelodeon game show host so uh yeah i got to travel the country hosting such shows as game lab totally nickelodeon you pick nick you name it if it involved dumping slime throwing pies humiliating adults i got to do it it was a great job now i'm going to tell you right now life on the road was not always easy there are some stories to tell and that's what i'm going to do here today i'm going to share some of those stories with you more important though i'm going to share some of the lessons with you because little did i know back then when i started on this journey it would lead me down not just a path of fun and games but a whole new way of life and living because on a fateful day in august when i was dumping slime i felt like slime I wanted to die. I came to the realization, finally, that I'm an alcoholic. Wow. So here is the great irony. Back then, when I was hosting shows for Nickelodeon, mess was my life, but my life was a mess. In fact, you know what? I used to have this joke I would say with my friends. We'd be at like Waffle House, 2 a.m. in the morning. Waitress would come up. She'd say, how you want your eggs, honey? And I'd say, scrambled like my life <laughs> my life was scrambled back then i mean let's face it i was an alcoholic entertainer for kids i was the original crusty the clown <laughs> now how did i become an alcoholic in the first place well you know what i believe i was born that way it's you know certainly not something i ever strive to be not once when i was hosting shows for nickelodeon did this ever happen Hey, Billy, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be an alcoholic. <laughs> that never happened. So growing up, I always felt a little different. I never quite fit in. I was afraid of everything. I, here's a direct quote from my baby book. Kelly is afraid of grass. I was afraid of grass. Who's afraid of grass? Me. The worst part was the voice. I call it the voice. It's not an actual voice. I'm not like schizophrenic or anything. It's, it's that constant voice going, you're worthless. You'll never do anything. You'll never be anything going. So when I discovered alcohol, the first time I took that drink, suddenly I was the life of the party. I was fearless. And the best part of it was that constant voice was muted. So yeah, I, I, I really believe I was born an alcoholic. You know, one part of my story that uh, is a part of a lot of alcoholic stories, I never did drugs, and that's really unusual. A lot of alcoholics did dabble in drugs. And I didn't do drugs because there was a story back when I was in high school that really hit me hard, and it really stayed with me. Uh, so I'm going to share this story with you that helped me stay away from drugs, because God knows I was offered drugs plenty of times, but I always said no. And so here's the story. So back in the 80s, there was uh, this basketball player, Lynn Bites. He played for the University of Maryland. He was superhuman. He was destined for greatness. This guy was going to be bigger than LeBron James, Michael Jordan, you name it. He was destined for the Hall of Fame. So the summer of 87, he got drafted to the Boston Celtics. He went out. He did what every kid would do who just got drafted to the Boston Celtics, right? He went out to party with his friends. But he got offered cocaine. So he made the decision to take that cocaine. And it turned out to be the last decision he would ever make that killed him. So when he should have been headed off to uh, the Boston Celtics for training, this is where he was. And this is where the fallen star landed. So this young man's really bad life decision helped me to make a really good life decision and not take drugs, saved my life. So that leads me to my first big lesson I'm gonna share with you today. Decisions have consequences. Light bulb, right? <laughs> That's so obvious. It's so easy, but you know what? This is the easiest lesson to forget or ignore, I don't know, it's one or the other. Especially when you're young. You don't think you have any consequences, but you do. All it takes 
is one night, one bad decision, change your life forever. Just ask Lynn Bias, he would tell you, if he could. All it takes, one night, one bad decision, change your life forever. But you know what, on the positive note, all it takes is one good decision. I made the decision to go to college. I went to Flagler College in St. Augustine, Florida, where I double majored in theater and commu communication with a minor in beer bonging. <laughs> yes, I was quite the party animal back then the life of the party. My alcoholism really thrived in college, I'll tell you that right now. But you know what? Everybody drank excessively in college, so it was really easy to mask my alcoholism. I did start to suspect I might not drink like normal people. And in fact, I remember my best friend Amy saying to me, Kelly, do you think we might be alcoholics? I said, you know what, Amy, so what if we are? We're not hurting anybody. So we made the decision to keep drinking recklessly, and it would be a decision we later regretted. Let me tell you a little bit about my friend Amy. Amy and I, if you're ever lucky enough, you're gonna come across your soulmate best friend in life, and that was Amy. We came as a party pair, we were inseparable. You invited me somewhere, you knew Amy was coming, you invited Amy, you knew I was coming. Amy was just a beautiful human being inside and out. I'm not, I'm not gonna say she was a saint because she definitely was not. I say she was like an angel with horns. <laughs> she looked like Snow White but had the vocabulary of a truck driver, okay? We all did kind of back then. We used to joke with each other that we were gonna knock each other off so we could get our straight A's. You guys, you remember that, that myth in college that if your roommate dies, you will get straight A's? I found out that is actually a myth because November 6, 1990, we all went out for a night of partying and Amy never came home. She never would come home. We waited and waited, never happened. So I was forced to make two phone calls I never thought I would ever have to make. First one was to the detectives to report my friend missing and the next was to her parents and let them know her daughter was missing. And then the next few months were just a blur of going on news shows, talking to detectives, talking to psychs, whatever it was gonna take to find my missing friend, I was gonna do it. Well, they found her body on New Year's Day uh, in a shallow grave. Turned out what had happened was she was on her way home from the bar and a couple of local townies pulled over and invited her to go in the car. She made the decision to go in that car. All it takes, one night, one bad decision. Now, you know, normally I would have been with her. I said, like, we come as a party pair, right? But I had a really bad hangover from the night before, so I made the decision to go home and go to bed. I say that decision either saved my life or it ended Amy's. I don't know which. You know, I don't know if I would have been with her, if I would have been able to stop her from going in the car or if I would have just jumped in the car with her. I, I'm pretty sure I, I would have just jumped in the car with her and met the same fate. So the unthinkable had just happened. My best friend had just been murdered. You think it can't happen to you. I tell you what, I promise you it can. And when it does, if it ever does, God forbid, you're going to find yourself in this just excruciating guilt, pain, sorrow, remorse. You know, you would have thought this would have been a, just a big wake-up call to quit drinking, but it wasn't. No, no. All I knew to ease the pain was just to douse it with more and more alcohol. So I drank more and more, and I sunk deeper and deeper into despair. Now, at this time, that once muted voice was now screaming at me. Who do you think you are? How dare you deserve to live? Your best friend died because of you. You should just kill yourself. That's what the voice was saying. So one night I decided, you know what, I'm gonna listen to the voice. 2 a.m., we were walking home from the bar. We were at a busy intersection. The cars were coming and going really fast. And I said, you know what, I'm just gonna keep walking. If I'm meant to be, I will be, and if I'm not, then so be it. 
So I kept walking, and by the grace of God, I made it across that street unscathed. How, I don't know. My friends tell me I came really, really close to not having that happen. So that's going to bring me to my next big lesson. When you're trapped in the dark, seek the light. Suicide is not the light. You don't seek the dark when you're in the dark. Suicide is permanent darkness. Problems are temporary. Suicide is forever. It's not the answer. Time is the answer. But time takes time. Suicide robs you of that time. You guys know, after I lost Amy, I thought my life would never feel normal again. But you know what? It, it did get better in time. In time. I think about how much I would have cheated myself had I actually succeeded in my feeble attempt to kill myself. Suicide is never the answer. That's the darkness. So what was the light? I needed to find the light. And for me, the light was spiritual connection. I needed to reignite a spiritual connection because that flame had gone out a long time ago. So I decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to church and just see what happens because I, I had nowhere else to go. So I remember walking into church and just looking around, feeling like the biggest hypocrite for even being there. I felt like a robber who had just robbed a house coming back begging for help. I sat in that pew and I prayed, biggest prayer. I was like, God, I'm so sorry. How can you ever forgive me? And just then, from this voice, it was like a different voice, not the same voice, a different voice came and said, I will never forget you. I have carved you in the palm of my hand. At that very moment, the priest echoed, I will never forget you. I have carved you in the palm of my hand. What? OMG. The big man upstairs had just talked directly to me. I firmly believed it. I was in awe. I was like, I hear you. I hear you, God. I am, I'm going to make some big changes from this day forward. From this day forward, I am. I'm going to start going to church again. I'm not going to quit drinking. Let's not get crazy. But I will go to church. And sometimes I went to church drunk, but I started going again. So that flame, that spark was reignited to my spiritual life, even just a little bit. It was there. Now, the other darkness I found myself in was just the streets of St. Augustine. I was still wandering around the streets, and everywhere I turned, I was haunted by the ghost of Amy and things we used to do, places we used to go. So I had to find the light. And for me, that light was home. The safety, comfort, and love of my family. So I packed up my bags and I headed home to Orlando, Florida. Now, going back to Orlando, Florida happened to be a really good decision because Universal Studios had just moved in down the road. So I um, auditioned. They were hiring studio guides. And I said, OK, I'll, I'll audition. So I auditioned for to be a studio guide. And I got the job. I was so excited to be a studio guide at, at Universal. Now, let me just tell you guys, a studio guide back then was much different than the one in Hollywood, OK? So in Hollywood, you'd go on this two-hour big tour through a back lot rich with movie history. You'd see King Kong. You'd battle Jaws. You'd live through an earthquake. You might even see your favorite star walking around. Okay, so the tour in Florida back then was like a 20-minute tour. We went through a bunch of empty back lots, <laughs> saw a bunch of empty sound stages. <laughs> the only sound stages that had anything going on were sound stage 18 and 19, also home to Nickelodeon Studios. So let me tell you, if you're looking for the light, Nickelodeon Studios is the floodlight. <laughs> it exuded energy and fun. And one of the cool things was we actually got to give tours of the studio as well. So I love that. You know, in fact, I'm going to take you guys on a tour with me back in the 90s, as if we were back in the studios, OK? So here we go. We're going to approach the studio. First thing you see is our green slime geyser. It erupts green slime every eight minutes to the delight of families. And then you go to the queue. 
It's full of fun, wacky music, big patterns. You take your group inside into Soundstage 18, where you might see Mark Summers hosting Double Dare. On to Soundstage 19, you might see Clarissa explaining it all. And then we go back down the escalator into the Gak Kitchen, where the Gak Meister would tell you how we make Gak and Slime, and one lucky kid would get to sample Booger Gak. <laughs> it was the highlight of the tour. Now one day, the studio was a buzz. They were going to be hiring uh, game show hosts to host this new show.